Welcome to the Green Ring, and thanks for watching this note-by-note -note dissection of Wagner's Der Ring des Nibelungen. This video is seventh in a series of sixteen devoted to Die Valkyrie Act I. Built on nearly two centuries of scholarly literature, it's a massive journey. I hope you'll take with me, one I'm dedicated to finishing. For an explanation of who I am, and more on the reasons for this series, please check the preface video first in a group of six building a foundation to this in-depth analysis. Before diving into this video, you may want to watch The Case for Erda, The Case Against Wotan, and The Case for Loge, which present my views on how and why Wagner manipulates his musical syntax as he does, in the process identifying key morphemes, which I believe define the entire work. You'll find explanations for why the terms leitmotif, motif, and motive have been replaced by morpheme, module, and cell in the chapter titled Music as Text. Links are provided in the comments below. My aim is to mount subsequent videos each week with breaks of approximately a month between each drama's acts until the entire ring is analyzed. We pick up where we left off, Zygmunt continuing his narrative just after discovery of his slain mother and abducted sister. Dover full score, page 41, top stave. Zygmunt rounds out this first section of his narrative, collapsing into a few lines his youth at Wotan's side beleaguered by enemies, his first phrase atop cello pedal established by its final E-flat after his rage against the nightings, his vocal lifting on thirds through a pair of low ash intervals to outline an abandonment triad, presentiment of what his father will soon do to him. From it, he slides down another spear-like extended reverse melody note strophe, punctuated with a second resentment pulse, violas assisting with semi-quavered cellos into a pedal, gradually intensifying its minor third chord. Atop it, he echoes his previous line, two ash intervals, two low ash intervals, outlining abandonment, followed by extended reverse melody notes, here extended through a static note triplet to conclude on an anti-barrier, and a mild distortion of the curse's ring lust. He rests a crotchet halfway through the measure, launching a boisterous hunting evolution, its reduced Valhalla ash intervals on fourth horn. What were formerly reverse melody notes here become fourth and third bounces, bassoons taking a more aggressive role, finishing fourth horn static intervals with their own, leaping both up and down from them into triplet quaver bounces. Amid this hubbub, Zygmunt resumes on the next downbeat, his reverse ash interval on a second falling a fourth, to rise through reverse chord notes into a defiant anti-barrier. After a semi-quaver rest, orchestral clatter increasing, he follows with a swift low ash interval, then a longer static interval, which segues into a second anti-barrier, albeit on a fourth. Opposing horns bassoons move through a half cadence, leaving a minimum orchestral rest, during which he finishes by plunging a sixth to lift on reverse chord notes, as a bold horn bassoon fanfare joins his last note, the first Valhalla ash interval bouncing up then down fourths, its second up a fourth to finish on pure air to melody notes. With the harmonic surprise of its final chord, this bold yet ominous coda finishes by compressing a bouquet of related syntactic modules into a single economical passage. From a jarring E-flat minor chord, Zygmunt bounces up then down fourths, echoing the fanfare's Valhalla ash intervals, the harsh bassoon horn chord fading away to leave only soft violas cellos. The Velosong's fourth bounce also initiates a barrier, albeit on a descending fourth whose melody note spine is rhythmically enhanced by a low ash interval. After a minimum rest, allowing the term Wulfing to sink in, he continues through another rising fourth into a Welterb triad, evoking Velsung's sympathy. As he does, horns breathe forte piano erda chords. 
The cadential harmony, familiar to contemporary ears thanks to more than a century of imitation, nonetheless would have struck listeners of the day as eerily strange, remaining evocative even to modern ears. It's all to the narrative's purpose, as he finishes with a low ash interval that rises another fourth, in echo of the immediately previous, as well as the fourth bounce with which he launches the passage, charging the whole with fourth-based presentiments. Siegmund's finish, an ominous plunging fifth, coalesces these mere four measures into a tight group of interconnected ideas. Vilson racial integrity as Wotan's latest ploy to co-op natural power by turning Albrecht's plans on their head, all of it mixed with Erda's hand in directing the immortal schemes to her own purposes. Little surprise, this gauntlet at last evokes a response from Hunding, cards held to his chest, complimenting the tale, cynicism that conceals he already knows and hates the Wolfing clan. In the measure sprung from the last note of Siegmund's revelation, an octavo low-string pulse precedes the knighting, static notes in his morphemes rhythm. With its static ash interval, seemingly incidental dour bassoon cording spreads in minim semibreves across the eight measures of his interjection to outline a pair of dragon strophes, hinting at the knighting's similarity to Alberich's clan, albeit in race and temperament only. As tellingly, the first ends in a truncated god turn, while the second concludes with that morpheme in its entirety, contrapuntally pitting nightings against Velsons. His syntactically rich vocal begins with a fourth bounce mocking Siegmunds to continue through reverse melody notes shaped by a dire inverted ash interval, which construes its last two pitches as chord notes, atop that throbs double impact. The rhythmic bundle repeats whole, as, after a quaver rest, the knighting lord continues with Alberich's warning module, elided to Fafner's threat against the god's immortality, the last ironically set to the words, Kunergast. After his next crotchet rest, Hunding intones Weval to chord notes, and Der Wolfing on a heroic rising fifth, which plunges a dire octave as Bassoon's second dragon iteration effects a key change to A minor. This segue reduces the low string pulse to three Valhalla Ash Intervals triplets, as preface to each of the knighting's final three phrases. He starts the first, bouncing through static notes that bracket a swift version of Zygmunt's Wolfing Bounce, a phrase he caps in reverse chord notes. He then echoes that line raised to second, this time reducing its bounce to a third, while falling on a sinister inverted ash interval finished with chord notes proper. After a crotchet rest, his last phrase intones a static ash interval to lift a second into a third descent, concluding his observations with another of Fafner's threats, punched by the low-string ostinato's lone static ash interval. Hunding's text, admitting he's heard tales of Wolf and his contentious offspring but never laid eyes on them, solves the immediate believability issue of why he doesn't recognize the Velsung on sight. Its deeper implication is, given his elevated station, the knighting lord needn't bother with such minor annoyances, provided they don't graduate to flagrant outrage, which comes to roost with a vengeance in the last third of Siegmund's narrative. Unusually fascinated with the stranger's father, Sieglinde chimes in atop a pedal established by Low String's previous static ash interval, the soon's fading. Her vocal initiates on a revealingly swift wolfing bounce, which she follows with the reversed melody notes of their shared racial identity. After a quaver rest, she rises a third into an authentic anti-barrier, meaning with heroic rising fifth, which goads low strings to a bold declamatory module what could be dismissed as no more than a colorful flourish to introduce this second chapter of Siegmund's narrative, were it not for its compact syntactic potency. 
The module launches on two scalar uprushes resembling those in Hunding syntax, an appropriate introduction to that nighting assault the Velsung describes. The syntax's conclusion, however, though a clear echo of those earlier hunting cells, also yields both a startling reminiscence and a unique presentiment, its melody notes eluding seamlessly with their reversal, capped by a baleful rising tritone. This god turn has played a key role since Rheingold, subtle marker of Wotan's nascent racial plans opposed to dwarf and giants. These embryonic intimations acquire full syntactic weight during the god's inspiration on how to combat his enemies by siring the Velsung race, a phrase setting the barrier in stone through its initial plunging fifth. The syntax's echo here in Valkyrie concludes instead on an upward leap, thus an anti-barrier, whose tritone harks back to Albrecht's embryonic barrier. The most striking aspect of the module's terminus is its subtle forward-looking hint towards where Wotan's Rheingold aspirations will ultimately lead, yet another mystery to await its time. Zygmunt leaps in a cappella, moving through the curse's ringless cell into extended reverse melody notes, another module forging syntactic associations with Velsung heroism. Bassoon's horns answer with the triplet harmonized demi semi quaver treaty arpeggio, Wotan's Rheingold pushback against the giants, to announce a bold fanfare hawking back to the Velsung peregrinations. Yet it's also a true anti-barrier, upward fifth intact, an echo of the introductory module which he follows with its melody note opposition, extending its reverse melody notes. Zygmunt's words affirm the god's schemes hinge on stirring conflict between these two races. Ein starkes Jagen auf uns stellten die Neidinge an. Orchestrally, the Velsung's brief description of the battle combines hunting pulses with third and fourth bounces from their latest syntactic evolution, strung with insidious contrabass viola resentment strophes, here shortened to resemble the passage's introductory module. Siegmund's vocal triplets mirror this with a hunting horn sound of their own, a fourth bounce, swifter than its Wolfing incarnation, then an upward leaping sixth and plunging third to introduce a module very like Donner's embryonic heroism. After a dotted crotchet rest, low strings opposing their downward resentment flourishes with rising ones, he lifts after his quaver rest on reverse chord notes, followed by melody notes, a subtly abbreviated giant turn. With his next quaver rest, the Velsung essentially repeats that module, one sounded previously in his vocals, whose mirror reversal acquires remarkable significance in Act 3, where it points back to the Velsung's bellicose part in Warfather's racial schemes, the role played in those by giants and nibelungs, and the end result Erda intends for them all. On his top E pitch, Horn's bassoons cement this hectic climax by joining semiquaver fingered viola cello quavers in a spear scale, capped with a second violin contrabass semiquaver grace. With them, Horn's bassoons fall silent on a quaver sting, Zygmunt having lifted a fourth into his crowning a cappella spear scale echo, varied through a pair of triplets. His fierce bassoon horn sting punctuates with Hunding's ash interval. Here a reverse. The contrabasses answer a nighting resentment-like sting. Cellos respond in a unison semi-breve crotchet pedal as the young hero returns to Parlando style. This abrupt change of mood sets the stage for the Velsung's explanation of his father Wolf's disappearance in the midst of the skirmish, his multiple hesitations and bare-bones simplicity imbuing his words with ever-growing poignance. Atop two dotted semi brevi cello unisons, he sinks from two static notes on chord notes to lift through melody notes, another truncated giant turn, then sink in chord notes, itself a stunted god turn, 
a juxtaposition to markedly impact Act 3's syntax. He follows his semiquaver rest with the chord notes reversal on Versprengt, a viola pizzicato quaver in thirds punctuating his next quaver rest. After it, he lifts a third into another quaver rest, then sinks on reverse melody notes, which, together with his previous crotchet, also sketch extended reverse melody notes. Cello pedal resumes on the next downbeat a fourth below its former pitch, together with the chord notes of his reverse melody note pulse, unison viola pizzicato tapping his dotted crotchet rest. He resumes, lifting a fourth into another spear-like scale, this one phrased as reverse melody notes and chord notes, ratcheting up the sequence's pathetic disjointed tone with its continuing stress on his racial syntax. Two pairs of somber muted horn chords float his next two phrases on subtle air to chord harmonies, minims lifting on thirds into crotchet releases as he outlines the discovery of his father's empty wolf skin. With the first chord set, he rises a third to expand it into a ringlust pulse, topped by a descending fourth. After a crotchet rest with the second horn chord bundle, he intones a bona fide anti-barrier. Zygmunt's final statement begins halfway through the next measure, pizzicato viola cello chord tapping the first note of his ever more diffident vocal as it rides pizzicati string crotchets, their cadence falling across the next two measures on first and third beats. He sinks into them through another spear scale, meaning hyper-extended reverse melody notes, quickened by a central triplet to rest a quaver, rise a fourth, and sink a third. He finishes this melancholy period with his bloodlines reverse melody notes, dotted crotchet rests isolating the last two pitches as chord notes. With his final E crotchet and a brief triple time shift, trombones sigh a broadly hushed Valhalla Part 1 pulse, revealing Wolf's true identity just as Sigmund loses him. The orchestra, with the softest of reminiscences of the Wotan Valhall motif from the Rheingold, tells us who this wolf has been. The Meister intends this syntax to be easily spotted, Valkyr's first Rheingold morpheme apart from Donner's thunder, one with fruitful underlying significance. Wagner implied that Wotan, after his departure, remained the controller of Siegmund's destiny. It's a keen insight, but, like his fellow analysts, Cook doesn't remark on how this brutal abandonment shapes the Velsung race's future as a whole, an undercurrent with huge impact on the drama's top layer of meaning. A look at how Wagner adapted the original myths gives perspective to this unexplored subtext. Valkyr derives in the main from Volsunga Saga, the Meister's other two primary ancient sources being the poetic and prose Eddas, concentrating on Sigur, Wagner's Siegfried. These make it clear Sigmund's twin sister Signy isn't Sigurd's mother, the great hero's dam being Sigmund's second wife, Jordis. Wagner drew the name Sieglinde from his later medieval source Nibelungenlied, whose Christian morality presents Siegfried devoid of incest, the Norse gods never mentioned. Volsunga Saga alone offered Wagner a contiguous mythic narrative from which to craft his own unique take on the Velsungs, omitting details unsuited to his purposes as he assimilated its primary motives into his own characters. A mortal woman delivers Odin a son, who in turn sires Odin's demigod grandson unable to conceive. Cured by the god's magic apple, this grandson fathers Odin's great-grandson, Volsung, who raises his own twins at court, Sigmund and Signy being fully aware of their sister and brother. One king, Sigair, betrothes the reluctant Signy, Volsung hosting their nuptials in his hall, whose centerpiece is a mighty oak. 
Odin appears at the feast, buries a sword in the tree, and informs those assembled the weapon belongs to whomever pulls it from the trunk. Siegmund does so, earning Sigir's wrath. At this point, the narrative tangles considerably. Sigir kills Volsung and all his family, lacking only Signy and her brother, the latter escaping into the wild. Magically disguised, Signy comes to the unwitting Sigmund there and conceives on him Sinfjotli, father and son later sharing adventures unconnected with Odin, one of them involving wolf skins. With brother and son's help, Signy revenges herself on Sigir while dying in the process, after which Sigmund marries Borghild. King Hunding, who never knows the long-dead Signy, dies battling Borghild's son Helgi. When the jealous Borghild poisons Sinfjotli, Sigmund banishes her and marries Hjordis, whose jilted suitor retaliates by warring with Sigmund. During their last battle, Sigmund's sword breaks across Odin's spear, and, expiring in Hjordis' arms, the Volsung reveals she bears his son Sigurd, Wagner's Siegfried. As with his medieval sources for Tannhäuser and Lohengrin, the Meister boiled this chaotic narrative down to Valkyrie's succinct details, its many characters reduced to a handful, its diverse elements of tribal strife focused into the single knighting Velsung rivalry thread. In the process, Wagner increased the emotional weight of Siegmund's years alone with Wotan, distilling Odin's many disguises into Valkyrie's, Velsa, and Siegfried's Wanderer. However, Act One's incestuous element plays no part in Volsunga Saga's Odin. As she dies, Signy reveals to her brother the truth he's never known. I had our children, by Segir, killed when I taught them too slow in avenging our father, and I came to you in the forest in the shape of a sorceress, and Sinfjotli is our son. Because of this, he has so much zeal. He is the child of both a son and a daughter of King Volsung. The mythic Signy has no romantic interest in her brother, only wanting a racially pure offspring fit for their revenge on Sigir, leaving Sigmund alone to wet the boy's strength. Translated to Valkyr, Photon needs a racially pure warrior fit to deliver the ring, first making sure the boy is sufficiently tough to assault Fafner. Had Siegmund lived, how Wotan might have arranged that confrontation remains one of the epic's unanswered questions, rendered moot by the Velsung's death. Just as Signy keeps her incestuous secret from Siegmund until they venge themselves on Sigir, so the god keeps his heroic protege in the dark, leaving him without a backward glance in order that Siegmund's later seizure of the ring should appear unconnected to the immortals. Just as Signy has no emotional stake in her incestuous offspring, Wotan's demigod children are a means to an end, nothing more. The depth of his tactical error must wait for Act Two, but its emotional cost is writ large across his son's narrative. Wagner calls for a long hold on the Valhalla Morpheme's final chord, then places a fermata over the following crotchet rest to allow the syntactic message full voice, though at the moment all an audience need know is the mysterious Wolf is in fact Wotan, who returns to his fortress. The Velsung resumes, his subsequent life unfolding as a history of social ineptitude exactly as his father breeds him to create for himself, then endure. Zygmunt intones his longing for mortal company over three tenuto viola cello crotchet chords off the beat, his voice lifting a third into an anti-barrier, then, after a quaver rest, rising on reverse chord notes, into that characteristic fourth bounce. After a semi-quaver rest, mentioning women to reverse chord notes and a descending fourth, he falls silent during the next four measures as a sustained viola cello chord inspires first clarinet's lift through an arpeggio cribbing Freya's initial module, its light tinge of voluptuousness linking the Velsung's trouble to Wotan's Rheingold neglect of the goddess. 
This blossoms softly and briefly into triple time, as the string chord resolves through a high ash interval on a fifth, clarinets bassoon sighing two love pulses charged in loge bass sensuality. This represents the young man's entry into mortal society glowing with physical need, yet unprepared for its mature expression, while more obviously reminding us of Sieglinde, to droop through a melancholy spear scale with the slightest flavor of resignation. After a dotted crotch at rest shifted back to common time, Zygmunt keens his alienation over viola cello semibrevi chords that rise through extended melody notes, each launched in rests preceding his phrases. His first two phrases outline reverse melody notes, but with the third he rises instead on melody notes, only to begin the last with the fourth lift, then a slide down more reverse notes, his breeding potential frustrated along with his emotional needs. A forte piano low string octavo unison punches his next phrase. Immer doch warisch geächtet. The word immer taking the direst possible inverted ash interval, meaning on a baleful falling octave. In gracing the following reverse chord note opposition's top pitch, he sounds another reverse melody note pulse, from which he rises through a low ash interval on a pathetic minor sixth to sink on still more doleful chord notes. A harsh oboe horn diminished seventh chord punctuates his heartache, after which, having rested a dotted minim, he sinks on extended reverse melody notes with their subtle flavor of resignation. Over octavo low string unison semibrevi, his following crotchet rest isolates the word unheil as a chord note pulse, his phrase concluded on the reverse melody notes of the seemingly ill-starred Velsum race. The young hero then initiates four phrases, rather like questions and answers, mulling his values in opposition to what the world around him thinks good. Rising a third into the first, with a second violin viola quaver's soft punch, he moves through a low ash interval on a fourth to repeat his reverse melody notes. This triggers a series of three quaver chord bundles, cellos added to their weight on each measure's second and third beats, whose chord pairs initiate in rests preceding each of Siegmund's next three phrases. His first consists of a chord note opposition, capped by a rising fourth. The next initiates a sixth below to rise a fourth into more reverse melody notes, while the last, boldest of all, descends an ominous fifth only to recover with an anti-barrier. His lament over troubles on all sides expands the string choir to its fullest contingent, their duo of increasingly poignant chord modules moving from semibreve to crotchets, the first real passion in this second phase of his narrative. Their paradoxical dragon outline marks the giant Nibelung world around him, their second pulse finished by his own reverse melody notes, to create a limping god turn. Over this heart-tugging string passage, he sings a pair of extended spear scales, the first ended with reverse chord notes, the second an anti-barrier, his last note triggering first violins sobbing a high ash interval, on a third, beneath which low strings intone chromatic melody notes. In his quaver rest, strings initiate an erdachord strophe that finishes by resembling in contour, though not harmony, the second Tarnhelm unit, source of the toad morphine. Switching from minor to major, then immediately back, bass clarinet horns darken the last chord to imply Siegmund's pathetic isolation is part of Erda's design for a physical change in her world. With a powerful folk song quality, his reverse chord notes drop a third into bouncing fourths, his next phrase opposing the prior chord's Tarnhelm toad outline to rise a third, strings taking back focus with bona fide air chords, as he concludes his second narrative episode with another rich syntactic bundle. 
An ardent viola cello duo launches it, their inverted ash intervals on chord notes, Newman's generic 19th century sign of woe. While apt here, the cells also deepen Siegmund's text, Stranger in a strange land, blindly groping his way through a mortal society ruled by the god's haughty absolutism, Siegmund's anguish defies his own pedigree, with emotions utterly alien to Wotan. Erd accords and chord notes imply the Vala exploits Warfather's absentee parenting, along with his deliberate push for his son to reject those values he himself has established in mortal society. Building on a mother's fleeting but potent nurture, these harsh new experiences awaken in the young hero precisely that empathy er deprises above all else. Strings proceed through a heartbreaking pair of contrapuntally layered reverse melody note pulses, subtly orchestrated to bracket that module in Siegmund's vocal. Concurrently, though at a parallax, second violin's contrabasses oppose them with extended melody notes, a detail launched in violas by a plunging seventh, Erda's inspiration, an interval first violin soon echo with its opposite, the whole finished on an Erda chord half-cadence. The Velsung lifts through a fourth to his reverse melody notes, phrased two chord note pulses, and, after a semi brevi quaver rest to highlight the violin's rising seventh, leaps up another fourth. Anticipated by contrabass's plunging fifth, he echoes that interval with the first cadence chord and, a semi brevi rest for breath, finishes with a reverse ash interval rounded in reverse chord notes. As a whole, this passage is sharp, pain, all that audiences consciously sense is mirrored in the subconscious details of its conflicted syntax, as if Erda deliberately guides Siegmund to war with himself, essence of his Webelt alias. The instrumental coda to this, the narrative's second portion, begins with the single measure of timpani contrabass hunding rhythm, the knighting lord digesting this tale. Timpani rolls swelling from the next downbeat, the prior air chord modules well up poignantly into another contrapuntal juxtaposition of air melody notes with their reversals. On this measure's third beat, first oboe ascends lingeringly through a rare, pure world ash interval, the Velsung's nobility as a reflection of nature in its most primal state. The oboe sinks from it through hyper-extended reverse melody notes into an E-flat major key change and a single iteration of Velsung Love's sensual loge chromatics to characterize stage directions asking the Velsung to catch sight of Sieglinde's compassionate glance. She embodies that purity Erda most value, since, as an extraneous female, Wotan hasn't yet loaded her with the baggage her unwitting brother carries. It may seem paradoxical the Earth Mother's active proxy should nudge Sieglinde towards the young hero's bundle of contradictions, a man Wotan's covert manipulations turn against himself, but the Vala's plans are as yet unclear. Loge's sensuality fosters the pair's emotional generosity, Erda's balm for the world ash's ancient injury. On some preconscious level, the Velsung intuits he's fated to some unknown tragedy, his despair here in his narrative a palimpsest for guilt over loving Sieglinde. First oboe's line drooping towards silence through hyper-reverse melody notes is reminiscent both of the spear and resignation. That's it for this one. My aim is to keep these videos close to a half hour instead of longer ones to keep this from being more of an endurance test than necessary. The next video picks up where this one leaves off, Hunding's reaction to the Velsung soaring over his outcast status. Third stave of page 47 in Dover's full score. As always, thanks for watching, and please do leave your comments below. Time and energy allowing, I'll do everything I can to respond. Lastly, as all YouTubers know, your subscription to this channel by itself is a huge assist in completing this vast project. 
hit the bell to be notified of the next videos. With luck and your support, there's a lot more to come.